Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. This is Afghanistan's latest enemy, locusts. Millions and millions of locusts. The country already has the worst humanitarian situation in the world, with 97% of the population living in poverty. But a massive locust infestation is likely to make things even worse. This was a wheat field until a swarm of locusts hit it. The UN is preparing for the worst. Their predictions suggest up to 1.2 million metric tons of wheat and other crops could be destroyed. That's about a quarter of Afghanistan's annual production. If you look at it in monetary terms at today's rates, that could be up to $480 million. For a country that doesn't have enough money or food, these insects could be devastating. The methods used to remove the locusts may seem primitive, but it works. They're swept up in a giant tarpaulin. The previous government had spraying capability, but for reasons that aren't clear, this is not being used by the Taliban. The locusts here are destroyed by pouring them into pits dug in the ground and then covering them with soil. Local farmers are being paid by the UN agency to carry out the work. It's some money for families whose crops and livelihoods have already been badly hit. Since the Taliban took control of the country nearly two years ago, locust monitoring has lapsed. And even if these efforts mean the UN's worst fears aren't met this year, things could still get worse. The locusts are currently mating, some are already laying their eggs, and experts say if left untreated, the numbers next year could increase 100-fold. Exodus 10, 12 through 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Joel 1.4 What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. There is no doubt that the prophet Joel was warning his readers about a future day when God would judge all people. The day of the Lord the prophet Joel is referring to is the seven-year tribulation. Is this locust plague and the coronavirus warnings from God the destruction from the Almighty is coming? Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time.
We're going to turn now to the Middle East, where Israel and militants in Gaza have been bombarding each other now for three straight days. Other countries trying to broker a ceasefire, but so far no luck. And there's already considerable damage from strikes by Israeli warplanes inside Gaza and Islamic Jihad rockets inside Israel. Ian Lee has more. Sirens blare across southern Israel overnight as rockets from Gaza streak across the sky. Palestinian militants have fired more than 500 in the past four days. Israel has intercepted many, but not all. Yesterday, one rocket hit an apartment building, killing an Israeli man and wounding five others. Another destroyed Miriam Karen's house. She asked, who knows what the future holds for us? I survived today, and that's what matters. In Gaza, the suffering also continues. Israel hit roughly 150 targets. Palestinian officials say more than 30 people have been killed, including at least 10 civilians in the current fighting. This father carries the lifeless body of his 10-year-old daughter, one of the youngest victims. Parents there worry for their children. Melina El Hindi says we don't feel safe even at home. The worst fighting in months escalated after Israel targeted key commanders of Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Israel's prime minister warned his country will kill whoever threatens it. Egyptian mediators are now working for a ceasefire. The question isn't if they'll succeed, but rather when they do, how long it will last. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night, Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. These people fled their homes three months ago to save their lives. A gang took over their neighborhood. Some of their homes were set on fire. Those who resisted were killed. Sheila Filou says they have nothing left and need food desperately. Nobody is coming here to help us or bring us anything. All of these people sleep here. When it rains, we're flooded. Any possibility we have to leave the country, we'll leave. We're living like animals. This is the reality for people in Haiti right now. Violent gangs control more than 80% of the capital, Port-au-Prince. These people have nowhere to go. They were forced out of their neighborhoods because of the fighting going on between rival gangs. Many have lost their relatives. They say they're desperate and afraid. Fighting and kidnappings are common across the country. The police are outnumbered and outgunned. Prime Minister Ariel Henry has requested international assistance to help the government fight the gangs. At a government office in the center of the city, hundreds are lining up to get a passport to leave the country but finding a place to go is becoming increasingly difficult. Millions of Haitians are in desperate need of help. Chaos has once again taken over their lives, and it seems unlikely the situation will get better anytime soon. The fallout from the fighting in Khartoum is playing out in the heart of the Sahel, some of the harshest terrain in the world, vast and remote places that are no stranger to conflict and war. Those who arrive from Sudan cross the empty wadis in search of safety and water. Most are women and children. Some have been here for hours, others weeks. Halima Muhammad and her family arrived 12 days ago. Her husband and father went to buy supplies in Al Janaina, the main town in Sudan's West Darfur region. They haven't been heard from since the violence broke out a few weeks ago. 
I'm frustrated. We didn't get any news from them. We need tents, we need jerry cans, we need blankets, we need food. Everyone says they are afraid of being caught on the wrong side of the fighting. African Masalit communities here blame African Arab groups for the violence. I swear to God, the Arabs kill and beat people. We have small children, vulnerable people, blind people, and we all came to protect ourselves. They just burn everything. The Arabs don't leave us alone. When they come, they kill and rape and burn, and we're vulnerable. If we let them, they'll burn our houses with the people inside. I saw this in the last war in 2020. I saw it myself. They burned people, and I buried them with my own hands. Not all people say they are fleeing active fighting, but the fear of what may be coming is real. The conflict in Khartoum is worsening the threat of communal violence for people in West Darfur. A rumor is enough to send entire communities in search of safety. Generations who've grown up hearing stories of war and past tragedies are on the run, scared they might be next. Breaking overnight, we have reports of at least 10 tornadoes in Oklahoma. Severe storms hammered the middle part of the country from Colorado to Arkansas, but the area around Oklahoma City had the worst damage by far. Roxana Sabiri is in Noble, Oklahoma, that's south of Oklahoma City. This is the main drag here in Noble, Oklahoma. The tornado ripped the roof off this convenience store, tossed some debris onto the house behind it, and into the drive through at the Donut Palace. The National Weather Service says a team will be out here this morning to survey the damage. On the ground, on the ground, on the ground, on the ground. This video shows a tornado on the ground last night in Goldsby, Oklahoma, hitting the town just south of Oklahoma City. It was one of at least 10 tornadoes to strike the state Thursday. It's getting stronger. And in an area known as Tornado Alley, it's a sight to see these folks pulling over to take a look. It is still on the ground. To the west, in the town of Cole, this twister spun up debris as it moved along a highway. Hey, there's a bigger debris cloud. Once the storm passed, crews started cleaning up down trees and debris. The powerful winds peeled back siding and ripped the roofs off these homes and businesses. In the aftermath, neighbors were helping neighbors. You can see everyone out in the street wanting to help and make sure that everybody is okay and asking if they can do anything for anyone. Four other tornadoes hit three states yesterday, including this one in Kansas. And in Conway, Arkansas, drenching downpours coupled with strong winds sent a monstrous 600-year-old oak tree crashing into this home. The rain was so intense in East Texas, this college soccer field was inundated, and several roads in the area were impassable. It was a chaotic evening along the I-35 corridor here in central Oklahoma. Tornadoes ripping across this area, doing damage to this town. You can see utility crews are on site here now trying to restore power, at least the homes that can accept it. This one cannot, at least half of it badly damaged. The father of that family telling me they survived by getting in the closet of their home. This week, NOAA scientists announced that much of the western U.S. is no longer under extreme drought conditions, but the record amounts of snow and rain this winter is not without consequences. California's Central Valley produces a quarter of the nation's food, but a brutal winter, a parade of violent storms scientists linked to climate change, has led to this. Acre after acre, more than 150,000 in all swamped for so many crops, a total loss. It's going to hurt. It's a lot of money. Nader Malikin is a pistachio farmer. 99% of the nation's supply is grown here. What's the value on that pain? Um, 15 million, probably right here. 15 million? Yeah, that we've lost on 1,200 acres. The estimated damage from the floods, $1 billion so far. Remarkably, an even greater danger awaits. To Larry Lake, which was drained a century ago and didn't even exist a few months ago, has returned with a vengeance. Perched just outside Corcoran, it looks like an ocean. And in the mountains above, one of California's largest snowpacks on record is starting to melt. Forecasters say rising temperatures in the coming weeks could prove catastrophic. You kind of get an overwhelming sense of doom in a way. How do you stop this? With a lot of dirt, says farmer Brandon Goodhart at Lakes or Dairy. You are looking at we have what we've come to call the Great Wall of Stratford, and uh, we got 15 feet of dirt piled up. 
FEMA agents are on the ground assisting, but farmers say they are footing the bill to reinforce and add on to a nearly 15 mile long levee so we can hold back the rising tide. There's nowhere safe enough. This is where we house the milk cows. Or um, large enough to move his barn of cows. Is it possible where we're standing right now could be flooded out? Yes. Kings County Supervisor Doug Verboond says crews will finish the levee before the next major melt, but there's no guarantee it will hold. Yeah, Mother Nature's in control. We're just, you know, trying to put our finger in the dike as we go. Tonight, all hands are on deck while their hearts are sinking. We're a family farm. The family's been doing this for generations, and I'd hate to be the one that's at the wheel and we lose it all. If water is the source of life, here in Les Brugas de Francoli, the lack of water has become a way of life. It hasn't rained here in months, and the Francoli River is completely dry. For centuries, it had allowed the village to thrive. Catalonia is facing the most severe drought in living memory, and water scarcity is an ever-growing problem as the summer season approaches. We must understand that water is more important than gas, because without water, there's no possible life for humans. More than 400 municipalities face water restrictions. Alternatives help alleviate the problem. Across Catalonia, people are praying for rain, but for now, their prayers go unanswered. An aerial view of the Kalehe region in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo shows the extent of the destruction caused by last week's landslide. Homes, schools and markets were swept away. Hundreds of people were killed. Thousands are missing. A major road connecting South and North Kivu provinces was cut off. Volunteers like Amani Mulenga are trying to clear the debris as they look for more bodies. They are working on a bridge at the center of the village but it's no easy task. This is where most of the water came flooding through when the river burst its banks. I live near here. It's shocking to see the devastation. People are trying to save what they can from structures that are barely holding. Flood waters came gushing down the hills, bringing with them rocks, trees and mud. Most survivors are being treated for broken bones and bruises. People have told us they will rebuild their homes, but they know it's going to be a long, hard journey. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do, keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. It also seems logical to think that in his fierce wrath and anger that he would lift his hand. But is it biblical? Yes, it is. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. It seems as though God has lifted his hand of protection from the United States, and not just the U.S., but the world as well. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you.
I've been waiting for this one because I am as I think I might even be more stunned than Billy is on this one. Billy, you have essentially been warned by Facebook that they're going to ban you over hate speech. You got to let every fill everybody in on what the story is. What did you write that has Facebook calling you and threatening you? over hate speech. So this is bizarre. I log on to Facebook, I'm on my phone, and I thought this must be a mistake. I get this pop-up, it's on my phone, it was also on my desktop, and it said, your post goes against our community standards on hate speech. And I'm like, what in the world did I post? And so <laughs> I look, and there is a message from April 2nd. So this is old now, it's well over a month. And here's what I wrote. I wrote, Jesus died so you could live. Certainly as Christians, we're not to go out of our way to offend anyone personally. But the truth is, the Christianity itself is offensive, as we read in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. They inform me that nobody else could see the post anymore at that moment, that they have standards because they want everyone to, quote, feel safe, respected, and welcome. And then it says, if your content goes against our community standards again, your account may be restricted or disabled. And then it says, you can disagree with the decision if you think we got it wrong. So, of course, <laughs> I disagreed with the decision. Right. I mean, and I went through their process and I... I put in a grievance, whatever you call it, I, you know, and <laughs> a what, plea so crazy, to the robots plea. over at Facebook. Well, I thought, OK, they're going to a human is going to review. It. It's like when you put yeah. an ad together and on Facebook, anybody who's ever done an ad, they approve it. What ended up happening was I get a message a couple hours later and it says we have removed your post from Facebook. So now it's no longer just absent from people's feet. It's been removed. And it says we are unable to show content that goes against our community standards on hate speech. It says your appeal was reviewed. And your post does not follow our community standards on hate speech. So wow. Facebook or the machine or the robot, either this is a horrible mistake or Facebook doubled down. I don't know how the their whole system works, but does if, if it's been reviewed, I would presume that that means it's been looked at by an actual like human with eyeballs who's looked at it and said and, and read it and still has decided that for whatever reason, your post is inflammatory or dangerous or a threat to, to people, which I mean, you can't get a more, uh, that's just like the most watered down basic and concise uh, presentation of the gospel. And then Facebook is deciding to ban a sentence that essentially portrays the right. gospel. Definitely doesn't seem to make any sense. But again, just another indication of what it is we're up against because you don't see these quote unquote mistakes happening the other way around very often. So hopefully, hopefully you remained unbanned on, on Facebook, Billy. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24.12 And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. A stunning turn of events for an author who wrote a children's book about the loss of her husband. The comments on Amazon praised her for helping other families handle grief. Well, now she is under arrest, charged with murdering the husband she paid tribute to in that book. This mother of three was celebrated for a children's book she wrote about grief after her husband died. He was 39. It completely took us all by shock. But now a bombshell new chapter. She's accused of murdering him. Kuri Richens told authorities she found her 39-year-old husband, Eric, cold to the touch on the floor in their bedroom. 
The newly widowed mom posted this tribute video to her husband on Facebook. Life is just so damn hard without you here, she writes. Then she published this book teaching kids how to deal with grief. She titled it, Are You With Me? It features an image of her smiling husband in the clouds with angel wings and a halo. It's dedicated to my amazing husband and a wonderful father. Dad is still here, it's just in a different way. 33-year-old Richens was interviewed about her book by KTVX in Salt Lake City. My kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced. Her book gets five-star reviews on Amazon, very well written and from the heart. Thank you, Corey, for writing a book that helps young minds understand that spirits of our loved ones are around us always. But in a stunning development, Corey Richens was just arrested in her husband's death. Authorities say they found five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his body. She allegedly asked an acquaintance for pills so strong she called it the Michael Jackson stuff. Court documents say three weeks before he died, Eric Richens had gotten very ill after a Valentine's Day dinner with his wife. Eric told a friend that he thought his wife was trying to poison him, the documents say. He was 39. It completely took us all by shock. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. A dad watching a high school baseball game was arrested after deputies say he punched the empire. You can see the empire fall to the ground from the blow. This is video of the incident released by the Osceola County Sheriff's Office in Florida. Players rush over to see what happened, help the fallen umpire, and kick the dad off the field. This umpire is a 63-year-old man. He's a veteran, United States military veteran. He's a disabled veteran, okay? He does this because he has passion for baseball, and he likes to give back to his community. Um, and he loves to dedicate his time to baseball and to, and to kids. When deputies arrived, the dad was no longer at the game, but they used this footage to identify him. 41-year-old Jorge Ignacio Apointe Gonzalez. Deputies say the attack was prompted after one of the players started to argue with the umpire. He's basically laughing because I told him you're being arrested because I'm being arrested for defending my kid. A new report from the United Nations says more than 258 million people faced food insecurity last year. That's a 34 percent increase from 2021. The Secretary General of the U.N. says, quote, we're moving in the wrong direction, pointing to the fact that this is the fourth consecutive year that those rates have increased. I think a lot of people are surprised that after years uh, with this problem of food insecurity getting better, that it is doing so poorly. Now, fill us in on what's going on. Well, here's what's really quite remarkable. When I took this role six years ago, reluctantly, because I didn't want to do it, but I got talked into it, and God knows it's the greatest job I've ever had in my life, including being governor. It's just saving lives of people is just a remarkable blessing. And so we were 80 million people marching to starvation then, 80 million, went to 135 because of man-made conflict and climate shocks. That was before COVID. COVID comes along, it goes from 135 to 250 million. That was before Ukraine. So this report doesn't really include wow. all the countries in the world. So the real number is 375 million people on planet Earth that are marching toward starvation. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna get worse in the next eight to 12 months. You will have starvation. You will have destabilization of nations and you will have mass, mass migration. So this report to come out now is critical. The world needs to understand how fragile the planet, how the poorest of the poor around the world are really struggling right now. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.